Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Pursuit Podcast. In today's episode, Ben and I are joined by Dustin Huff from Southern Indiana and the owner of the largest typical whitetail ever recorded in the United States. We discuss his love for music and hunting, how a random decision to set up in a different area changed his life, how a text from a country music superstar helped connect him with the right people, the process of selling the antlers to a private collector, and what life looks like now as he tours the country talking about his experience. Please welcome Dustin Huff. All right, cool, everyone. We are live, like I mentioned, with Mr. Dustin Huff. This is a super special conversation, man. Thank you for joining us today. Sir, how are we doing? Doing good. Appreciate y'all having me. Definitely, definitely. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, man. I know you're probably doing all sorts of guest appearances now, so it's uh, probably a whirlwind for you. You know what I mean? Oh, it's been freaking crazy, man. <laughs> Just something I never would have thought of. So we'll tease it. we're teasing on it. So if you don't know, uh, this is a super special conversation because we're talking to the United States record holder for the largest typical whitetail deer ever taken. Second in North America, am I right? Yep, second in the world. Perfect, perfect. All right, Dustin, before we get into all that, let's go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and kind of give a little bit of background of who you are and what you got going on because you're much more than just a bow hunter you got a, a pretty other you know your other side gigs pretty cool too so go ahead and introduce yourself for us man cool man uh, i'm dustin huff i'm 28 years old just turned 28 yesterday actually yeah um from greensburg indiana real small town um grew up out in the middle of nowhere in the woods and uh started playing guitar when I was 12 and I turned that into what I do now as a singer songwriter traveling back and forth, uh, from Indiana to Nashville, uh, writing and recording songs. That's awesome, brother. That's awesome. So, but we'll get into the buck. I want to kind of give a little bit of backstory for you. So we first met, I believe, I don't even remember what month that was, but the, uh, the open season expo here in Ohio in Columbus, uh, our booths were actually, yep. uh, right across March. Yep. I'll say our booths were actually right across from each other. And I had told you kind of before mm-hmm. we started talking, it's kind of funny cause it kind of segues your story a little bit too, or, or parallels your story a little bit. But, uh, one of our pro staffers, Taylor and I were walking up to your booth, um, just from down on the other end of the convention floor there. And, uh, I was telling how a buddy of mine had passed up on a really big buck earlier that, or, you know, in the later part of last season, I said, yeah, he's about the size of that one. He goes, man, what are you smoking? And he's like, that's the biggest buck in the United States. <laughs> and, and we were joking. It's just, uh, you know, it's soaking, it's soaking uh, I don't know, uh, it, the bucket being typical, it just makes it hard to kind of fathom, like, how big he actually is until you're, like, literally hands on him. And uh, I know you kind of have the same story, yep. too. And we'll get into that when you, act, you know, the actual day of the hunt. And uh, kind of how you all process that and his size and not really know him. But, yeah, it was just funny. I'm like, you know, hindsight, you know, his, his 150, 160 wasn't even close. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. um, so I've heard you talk about it on other podcasts, too. And this is one reason why I think we really like to have you on is just you're just a guy that likes to hunt and fish and, uh, you know, and be out there just like Ben and I. You're, you know, you're not, you know, uh, keeping your secrets under lock and key and, and being so really, uh, I guess secretive about her thing, but this buck was actually kind of the best kept secret in your area. So I'd be interested to see kind of what you were thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, so like I said, whenever I, the first time I seen him was the, the time in the woods, the night I, the evening I killed him. Uh, but apparently after I killed this deer, everybody like, my adjacent neighbor, heck, there was neighbors from eight miles away yeah. that had trail cams of this pick for, or trail cam picks of this deer for three years. And I had no idea about him at all yeah. for three years. <laughs> That's funny. He's like, here this That's deer what's is. That's crazy about yeah. it. And I think the guys from Exodus may have had him on the, is it trail cam radio? I think they had the, the two guys. I can't remember their name off the top of my head. We don't have to get into it. But like, I think those two guys were on that episode talking, showing the pictures. 
and showing like their their history with him and how they had him at like three and a half and i think he was like what three and a half i think he was like 170s or 180s at three and a half or something crazy like that i remember i heard you say he jumped up like 30 something inches within a year yeah so he was at three and a half they were guessing about 170 175 and then the next year whenever he was at four and a half 11 pointer uh, they guessed him at about 195, and then somebody found those sheds actually, and brought him to the Indianapolis show I was at, yeah. and had him scored. And it was actually 197 is what he what he scored as a four and a half year old with a, giving him a 20 inch spread. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. I mean, that's just something you yeah. can't even, you can't even fathom it, right? So. Um, like I mentioned, you're, you're hunting, uh, and we won't have to give away specifics. I know you got enough, uh, enough joking about that on meat eater the last time you were on there, but, uh, talking about the, just the area in which you're hunting, it's really similar to probably what a lot of us experience is just normal hunters, you know, knock on door permission or, or family farm kind of stuff. So can you kind of talk a little bit without getting into detail, like, uh, the area that you're hunting and just kind of how you have family history there? Yeah, so uh, it's a 185-acre hog farm. Uh, I've been hunting this, squirrel hunting it since I was 10 years old. I know my dad's been deer hunting it since, you know, he was in his late 20s and 30s. And um, then whenever I started getting big enough to, you know, tag along with him to go sit in a deer stand and kill, killed my first squirrel there, killed my first deer there, my first buck. Um, just a lot of history. Um, it's got fingers coming through so it's 50 percent timber 50 percent crops uh like i said there's hog barns on it uh okay. had to vaccinate hogs there a couple times yeah power wash the, the slats you know so oh, i've been, I've been uh, there too bro. yeah a lot of history there oh yeah so uh just it's just one of the places just with a lot of memories and uh it's just a fan like you know the property owner who lets us hunt there i mean he's he's got a family so his boys are hunting you know, so we just all, it's pretty much just a family thing that yeah. we just all go deer hunting and try to try to stack up as many as we can. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I, yeah, I think I heard you say on meat eater that, um, that particular area, I think your, your largest out there was what? 130, 135, somewhere in that ballpark, which is, I mean, it's still, it's not like you're, it's not, it's no 216 or 211, but it's, that's still a really respectful yeah. deer, man. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. 130. That was my, um. 20 buck was 134 yeah. uh, and i named him larry actually. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think i saw him on your instagram and i'm like man that's a that's a hell of a buck but just by itself and i think what your dad i think yep. you heard, i heard you say your dad's buck on there was probably what in the 50s yeah one we guessed him 153 uh but then like now looking at him that was years ago uh i had a buddy come over he's like he's, he's probably a 170 class deer oh okay but with you know as as a net he's about 150 is what my one buddy was saying so gotcha gotcha let me go ahead oh i'm losing you here in just a little bit you still hear me buddy yep all right cool your, you. your video cut out there for a second i'm sorry um let me get in here real fast and so on this property <clears throat> excuse me i know you said you were hunting a lot on like kind of like the eastern side can you kind of lay out what what this property looked like in terms of the layout i know you said i heard you on another podcast talk about just kind of leaving that area over there to uh to the deer and kind of letting the deer have that area what and then you were hunting it pretty hard so i mean it, I know the story of the buck, you know, we'll get into is kind of just, you know, kind of random draw, but I mean, in hunting in general, mm -hmm. you kind of had a mind to set about you. You kind of had a game plan on what you wanted to do. You wanted to kind of talk about your game plan and kind of, you know, when you were hunting and kind of how that process was all working out for you. Yeah. I mean, so I always, uh, take off the last, you know, I, I hunt a little bit during, well, whenever I was younger, I would hunt, you know, October 1st, first day I'm out there yep. in the hot, you know, Oh yeah. but now I kind of wait until the third, fourth week and really, you know, just kind of wait for it to cool down, wait for that rut to start kicking in pre-rut. And so I always take off the last weekend of October and then the first week of November. And that's whenever I just hit, hit the woods hard, you know, 10 to 12 days in a row. And, uh, so yeah, I was on day, I was hunting, you know, October 29th, I believe, was the first, like, day I got in there where I was like, all right, this is this is my game plan for the next, you know, seven, eight days, however long it takes to put a deer down, you know. 
Yeah, um, yeah. So I was just up there deer hunting, and I got four set stands on that property that I just mix it up depending on when, and just I just kind of base it off my gut feeling, you know. I just kind of sure. get up that day and go, well, I got a you know a west wind, I got a northwest wind or something, and I'll just kind of go pick a tree basing off that. I don't really, you know, you know I I've hunted that property so many times i've know where i've killed deer i know yep. where my where my dad has killed deer deer i know where i've seen the most deer you know and then i just kind of base it off that um i don't run trail cameras on that property yeah um, I, was gonna, I was gonna mention that because i heard you say that before that you're not really running trail cameras so that would kind of lead in right to the fact that you wouldn't even really know that he was in there i mean potentially yeah and that's whenever people ask me they're like so you had no idea i'm like yeah i i don't you know keep yeah. track of deer out there it's just i know there's deer out there so i just you know yeah, I've hunted exactly. this for 50 years. well that kind of leads into the fact too like you're not out there actively i mean all, everyone wants to shoot a 170 180 plus deer you know what i'm saying but like i mean even smaller than that you know like like you shot a 135 like that those are all respectable numbers and then so you're out there just trying to shoot just to shoot you're not like you're actually actively targeting a 200 inch class deer you know what i mean yeah and that's i'm just always i just try to be i was just trying to beat my one from 20 i call it my covid buck yeah uh, the 2020 deer that and so yeah and that was you know my first buck i killed was a piebald little eight 15 inches wide and you know i'll shoot anything that's close to 15 inches wide so yeah. but then whenever i shot that 134 in 2020 I was like, well, shoot, like, I'm going to try to get a 135, a 140. And that was, that whole week was my game plan was just to shoot a 135, 140 class deer. Exactly. That's, yeah, I mean, that's that, that's the game plan for all of us, right? Yeah. Uh, yep, me... just try to beat beat what we did the, the time, the year before. Oh, for sure, for sure. So, um, let's kind of talk about the, uh, the morning or, you know, the, uh, the day of, I know you, you had shot him in the afternoon, um, kind of what run us yep. through kind of the process. I know you had kind of just randomly picked a spot, but let's go ahead and kind of run through the process of that day and kind of how that all transpired, man. Yeah. Uh, so that more, I'll never forget that morning either. I seen tons of deer that morning. I was hunting, uh, my main stand, it's a buddy stand, uh, that I killed a doe out of October 31st on Halloween. Uh, my nephew killed a little five pointer um, on Halloween, so I was hunting. So that was four days later. Yeah, four days later that morning, and I I had eight or nine deer uh, that morning, and I believe one. Here's what's crazy. I think, and I don't know if this was moose or not, but I remember that morning. It was late, about ten o'clock at that morning, and I set till about noon yeah. that day, and um, there was. There was a doe come running out uh, close to the fence fence row, about 45 yards from me. And I was going to shoot her, but she kept looking back. And she was she was kind of you know she was she was running from something. So I was guessing there was a buck behind her. Yeah. So I'm waiting, and I'm just looking back in this these poplar trees, and I'm just waiting. It's pretty thick back in this brush. Um, and this is the morning of. And so I'm just and about five minutes after I see that doe go by, I start seeing legs. And I just see these legs, and I'm, I'm guessing it's a buck, but I can't see any head deer or nothing. Yeah. And right whenever I'm just getting ready, he walks about 15 yards, and I'm waiting for him to step out from these poplars, and he never does. Like, like I said, I haven't. Yeah. I don't even see any head deer that's so thick. I just see, you know, his body. Sure. And sure enough, right, he needs one more, I'd say, a couple more yards before I can, he's out of the, in the clearing where I'll be able to see what kind of deer he is. Yeah. Well, right before that, he just takes and goes straight south <sighs> and hits this fence row and just walks this fence row where that doe was going. And so I don't know if that was moose or not, but it was a mature deer for how he was acting. I have no yeah. idea what it was. It could have been moose. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was that was that morning. So I was, you know, I'm going to go back to this stand the next morning. Well, you know, I got out of that stand about noon that day, went back, got lunch. Um, and it was about three o'clock is whenever I, you know, was like, let's go back out. Um, uh, and I was going to go back to that stand, but then I just told myself, I'm going to go there in the morning. I had, you know, eight or nine deer this morning. So we'll just, it's a morning stand. So 
that that was the reason why I took my climber. I was just like, you know, it's a 45, 50 degree day, and I was just like, I'm gonna go to that west end. I'm gonna watch this. I was just, just wanted to watch the sun drop because sure. that's the best. You get the best view on the west side of the farm, and uh, yeah, sure enough, <laughs> uh, I got up there about three o'clock. Three o'clock that evening, it wasn't even a thing. I dropped down into the creek, just went up this little draw that I. You know, it's a little oak flat up on this yeah. ridge through this big holler that comes through. And, uh, yeah, I just picked a tree, uh, sawed off two limbs on my way up, faced where the sun was going to drop. And sure enough, three and a half hours later, changed my life. <laughs> yeah, no joke. <laughs> Change your life is probably a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> so, uh, um... yeah, I mean, it's just. No, let's get into it. So uh, he obviously, I know, I, I've kind of heard this story before, but for our audience here, um, so he's walking in, I think what you saw him around 70, is that what I remember? Yeah, so like, and he just appeared, like, I remember my dad texted me, because he always texts me when I'm deer hunting, any deer, you yeah. know, any deer, and then, uh, and my girlfriend was texting me too, and I was about to text my dad back, and I just looked to my left, and all I seen was moose just facing me i mean his head was down like this <laughs> and all all i knew was that it's the biggest deer yeah. in my head it's the biggest deer i'd ever seen you know any anywhere and then he put his head up and whenever he put his head up i just started going oh my gosh like yeah you what start shaking like a thing? leaf oh my gosh sure. now. yeah oh uh, you know you start shaking and you're just like wondering where's this is this deer gonna come to me is it just gonna keep on heading to the east you know which way is it gonna go you know yeah and sure enough sure enough he it's like i had him on a string he starts coming up my ridge just i mean it was i started blacking out i feel like just because <laughs> yeah. the adrenaline was so and it's like i knew it was so thick too where he was coming up so like i had yeah. to make a decision pretty quick um and that's why i didn't get a range finding um if he would have stayed on uh, the draw closer to me, I would have, and that's what I was hoping whenever I first saw him. Like, if he stays on this side of me, then I'll be, I'll let him, you know, walk yeah. past me and I'll shoot him at, I'll shoot him at 30 yards. Sure. But he stayed on that west side of that uh, draw and he started quartering back like he was going to head west towards this uh, pasture and cornfield. And so that's whenever I, I was guessing 40 yards. And I just whistled at him the first time. And when I whistled at him, he stopped and he just stared at me. Like, I mean, I don't know if he saw me, but he knew something yeah, wasn't right. You, and I'm yeah. just staring right at him. You know how it is. Oh, sure. And I can't shoot him. Yeah. I mean, I, I have I have sapling trees going right in the boiler room where I have to shoot this deer. And so I don't know how much time went from that first whistle and then me, like, telling myself, like, you can't shoot this deer, like, do you got I, and I, I even told myself like do i try to shoot sh get to get his liver do i yeah chance the gut shot and i'm like no nah, you can't do that you know so i just said one more step i think i can maybe sneak an arrow as if he stops on one step if he don't then i don't know what i'm gonna do or like he was he would have been gone yeah um so i just let him take you know he was he was wondering what the heck was going on so i let him take one more step and i whistled give a real nice whistle low whistle again and he looks again, and he threw that left. He took one step, and then he threw that left leg for a second step, and that just got him barely out of where I can shoot him, like where I was sitting yeah. at. So I had to lean out to the left left side, just a hair on my tree stand, and sneak one through because yeah. he was quartering away a hair. No, yeah. <laughs> Smoke. All I all I heard. I mean, I was so you know the adrenaline. And, I, like I said, I felt like I was blacked out just because I lost sense of time and yeah. I mean everything. And so I heard it and I didn't even really know where I hit him just because I was just so distraught. But I was like, man, I was right on him. I know. And he ran about 50, 60 yards straight west. And all I can see is, you know, his tail and I can see the back of his rack. And he finally stops and he just looks around and I'm like, you know, I'm telling myself, go down, go down, go down. And he starts flicking his tail, and then right when he started doing that, I just started shaking oh, my head. Yeah. I was like, come on, baby. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Doing... <laughs> oh, yeah, and I said, go down, man. And then he started to go right, and then he went back left, and then he flopped over into the holler that he came from. And I just, 
I put my hands up and just started screaming, let's go, let's oh, go, yeah. you know. Oh, man, if only you had that oh, on like, camera. Imagine if you had that on camera. I mean, that'd be like million-dollar video footage right there. I know. <laughs> and what's and what's crazy is literally like the like I said, we leading up to that two weeks of hunting, like I told my girlfriend, I'm like, I would love to have a GoPro to take deer hunting with. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> never had one. And yeah. it's like, shoot, I wish I would have had that on my hat. Oh man. Or like a little uh and so we can kinda of get into that too a little bit. So you're using um a climber, right? You're using a, I think I heard you say you were using a climber on that one. So that's why you're cutting those branches down and getting up there. And then uh I know yep. I, I, I've heard you say this on, on Meteor, but I know some people, you know, everyone's got their opinion of versus bow versus crossbow. I mean, I know, I'm sure you know how it's like, you know, so, um, you still got to kill a thing, right? You still got to kill a thing. So there's always credit for that, but I want to kind of get, let's clear the air a little bit. Cause I heard you say this on Meteor and I don't think maybe some people listen to that. Maybe some people don't, but there's a reason why you're using a crossbow, right? Yep. And so you're, uh, you yep, said you got some, sh- some shoulder issues with your shoulder or something like that yeah it started happening about i'd say four years ago or so um yeah dude i just started and i didn't even know what it was i started getting like tingly in my arms a lot and i i started having this one growth on my back which i went and got it checked out from a doctor it's just a like benign like like a cyst yeah you know, it's non-cancerous. Well, then another one started growing about two years ago, and that's up, I believe, in my nerves. And, I mean, it, ever since that, dude, it's been – I'm going to have to get it taken care of one sure. of these days whenever yeah. I can, you know, get some, get some good insurance oh, and sure. uh, get it taken care of. But, yeah, dude, I, I bow hunted from – I bought my first Bowtech Diamond whenever I was 14 years old. I yeah. uh, got a Bowtech Tech 29 a few years after that killed plenty of deer with it all up until my early 20s until i you know and i probably could still get a bow back yeah but it's just i just know like there's sometimes Mm -hmm. it'll just go numb and i'm just like shoot i don't want to be in a situation where (laughs) i got a deer where i I got a shoot yeah we actually talked we by all means necessary right and we ben and i we had talked to um Adrian Wilson, I don't remember what episode it is, probably 15, 16, somewhere in there. Uh, so Adrian is down in Tennessee. He lives in uh, just, just east of Nashville, I believe. In, is it Franklin? And uh, from Tethered, have you heard of Tethered uh, Saddles or whatever? And uh, he had bro- oh, yeah. he yep. was telling us that like, he had broken his uh, wrist right before a season. You know, it's like people were giving him a hard time about using the crossbows, but, but he's like, hey, man, like I couldn't even climb a dang tree. Like I couldn't even do anything. So it's like – it's all by by any means necessary you know yeah. what i'm saying still killing deer don't matter yeah, what kind of oh exactly exactly so that's what i always said you uh it's you just, got, uh, go ahead sorry uh well what i was gonna say is just like i didn't even know there was like a yeah competition or whatever yeah, people want to call it in the you know me i'm just a guy a redneck that goes deer hunting <laughs> So it, it kind of makes me smile that there's this like big like because to me it's 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 deer hunting to me yeah. it's, there's not a it's just it's just life you know it's sure. not a competition or who can piss farther it's just <laughs> yeah. going sitting in a tree and hoping the deer comes by. <laughs> We have uh, our industry has a hard enough time as it is with other outside influence, you know what I mean? So there's no, it's never worth it, oh. you know, it, it's never worth it to to fight within ourselves, you know what I'm saying? So. Yep. and it's so funny because yep, exactly. your, your story like that story like yours and uh you just hear it so many times man it's just like the epitome of a whitetail story it's like it's the first time kid that goes in there and shoots a 140 or 150 it's a it's a guy like yourself that kind of didn't really know what he was going to do it just went over this area first time and what however a couple many years just to just to try something different after hunting for a week and then boom you know then your life has changed and it's like that's just the epitome of like just a typical whitetail deer hunting story. And I, that's what I love it. That's to me, that's the best part. You know I mean? The, the whole, I think the story would, I mean, it would still be cool, right? Cause you still have a record book deer, but I think the story would be diluted if you will, if you were this guy that, and, 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 and you know, not to belittle anyone that's doing this because we all try to scout, you know, I do it, whatever inventory picks and all that stuff. I think the story would have been so much more different if you're like, you know, I had this guy, I had this deer on camera for 
three years and I named them four years ago and then I've seen them grow from those guys antlers. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that story is just, it, 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 you, you hear it all the time. You know what I mean? And while yep. that's cool, yep. I think it just makes for even more interesting story. You know, just like this random draw, you know, what was it? We talked earlier, you know, hypothetically, I think uh, when you were talking with David Blanton, hypothetically, it was like one in 300 some million odds is what they gave you to shoot a deer like that caliber. And so I think that's what makes the story even much yeah. more interesting, right? Yeah, they said, like, I could have been struck by lightning twice before, <laughs> you know, hypothetically killing a deer like that. I'm like, dang, that's, that's the monitor right there. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. So uh, we get to the point where, uh, you, you, you know, you've taken them, you've seen them go down. Uh, kind of tell us about that evening because you – you were just going to be your typical self and just continue on doing the process, but you kind of had some friends maybe talk you out of that. Let's go ahead and talk about that post shot and kind of that evening and, and how that all went down. Yes. So, uh, I called my girlfriend was the first, like I called her like right after I saw him go down, I was still in the tree. I just called her. Cause like I said, I had been hunting yeah. eight days in a row and she's ready for me to come home. <laughs> didn't she, uh, and, uh, didn't she post, didn't she post like a, or was it you that shared the, the pic, the video they had like one of her girlfriends, like, the, uh, filming her or something while you were on the phone. The, it was, yeah, she got part of the phone call of whenever, cause she, her sister's always on you okay, know, her social media. So she was probably Snapchat. No, and, sure, sure. and, uh, so, so yeah, so she, Whenever I called, she must have been on her phone, Snapchatting or whatever, and she knew that I, how excited I was. Like something happened, just because. I mean, in the video, you can. Yeah, I'm you just could. Distraught. Like, I'm just, like I, I don't even know what to say. I'm just like mumbling words. And, uh, <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, and so I called her first. Uh, she's all fired up, and I'm like, I gotta call my dad. So I called dad, and then I called uh, the property owner's son, uh, Nick, and. Uh, I waited for out, so I got I got out of my stand, uh, packed up my climber, took it up to the field edge, and then by that time Nick came in, brought the side by side, but we couldn't get it down sure. to go get this deer because it's so fixed. We just left it up at the edge of the field, and then the property owner came, um, his other boys came. I mean, my brother-in-law came. We had six, seven guys out there um to drag this deer which i was ticked because i was like man i wish we could throw this on a four-wheeler oh, no joke. i just knew how 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 out of shape i am oh, after dragging that deer I, it humbles you I for sure how don't out it? Of shape I, was. I, was, I was laying on the ground dude. i was like dad you got any water i was just putting water on my face and uh so we got yeah got him in the truck and I mean, we were just, we had no idea. Like, we were thinking 170, 180 inch deer. And that was like pushing it because we, you know, to us, like, that's huge, you know? Oh, sure. Yep. That's awesome. So, uh, so after ahead. that, keep going, buddy. Uh, went, went back to the house. Uh, so, well, I gutted him right there in the, in the woods and, uh, drug him out, threw him in the truck, took him back to the house. And at this point, I had started, sending some snapchats to my buddies just like my close friends and uh two of them that are big you know they're they're always after a target buck every year and uh they said to me they're like huff that's a 200 inch deer like do not touch that thing like <laughs> yeah. they knew right away yeah. like that this thing was a possibly a 200 inch deer just by looking at it and uh so they're like we're going to be there in 20 minutes like and so, heck me and dad we we're about we we're about to cape him out you know we were going <laughs> to cut the Going without that river. I mean, she's yeah. ready to get him, get him get done. Stoned and, yeah, and so uh, they come over and they, they're they like, no, like, don't freaking touch this deer. Put the knife down. And then my buddy was like, you need to make a phone call, like, to a photographer. Like, this is a big deal. Like, you need to get pit professional pictures done. And, dude, I started laughing at him. <laughs> I, I bet, was laughing because I'm like, dude, what I'm the not hell you talking about? I was like, I'm not. Yeah, I was like, I'm not calling my photographer up to come take pictures. I was like, I got plenty of pictures in the woods, you know. Like we're getting pictures down here in the basement, and uh, so yeah, and it just kind of went from there. Uh, that that was, and then we had a few beers, you know, just kind of 
sat around and then we hung him up on the basketball goal uh, that <laughs> night. I love it. I heard you tell Waddell that. And I was like, man, that's the most country thing ever. I love it. I think I'm on the basketball hoop. <laughs> yep. Hung him up on the rafter by the, by the basketball goal right there. And wasn't, I mean, it wasn't until like later that night um, when I started Googling, you know, uh, what's the Indiana state record? I wasn't even thinking a world record. I was just thinking, what's the Indiana state record? Sure. And, uh, the numbers that my buddy had, you know, he's not a scorer or anything, but he put a tape on the deer and, uh, we had a number and I was like, you know, I didn't even know it, what it, 213, 214 inches. I was like, is that good? You know, yeah, <laughs> I sure. was asking, is that good? And, uh, he was like, you need to get this in a safe. And we just had it hung up. He was like, you need to get this locked up. And, uh, it wasn't until later I confirmed a buddy of mine, uh, Luke Combs called me. Yeah. Um, look at, he just, he, has, he just, I had he made just, a tweet. <laughs> he just uh, casually drops Luke. He's like my buddy. Of mine, he just casually drops Luke Combs in this reference here. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you, buddy. So he, Luke called you. Okay. Yep. So, because I had made a tweet, um, you know, after my buddies left and we had him hung up, I made a tweet like, killed the, I think I killed the biggest buck in Indiana. Well, I didn't post any pictures or nothing. So my buddy Ray Fulcher, who was on tour, I believe, with Luke at the time, texted me and was like, hey, old Huff, let me see this deer. So I sent him two, three pictures. And right after I sent those pictures, Combs was calling me. So I, it's like two in the morning, dude. It's like I was in bed, but I couldn't sleep. You know, I just kept sure. getting up to go look at this deer. And so I get up and I go to the kitchen and just took the phone call. And he's like, Bubs. He calls me Bubs. He's like, dude, you don't even know what you did, do you? I was like, it's a big deer, man. I was like, uh, what do you think about it? He goes, dude, it's going to change your life. And he was like, really like serious, serious about yeah. it. And I was just, you know, I was just still kind of laughing about my, like, oh yeah, dude, this is crazy, you know? And, uh, he goes, don't do anything. He goes, I'm going to make some phone calls for you tomorrow. And, uh, that's whenever he, uh, tipped off meat eater. Yeah. Um, and then they called, they called me the next day. And then that's kind of how it all, you know, social media blew up, uh, from that first story. Oh, for sure. And I'm glad you said that because I was just getting ready to segue into like becoming official and how he connected it with them. Cause I mean, obviously, um, Luke has got a relationship with Steve. So, mm -hmm. um, and you were just recently on their episode just a few weeks back. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, kind of go through that process. Like, uh, <laughs> here you are, just like us, just a, just a country guy from, from southern Indiana, getting a call to be on Meteor. How was that? How did that, uh, what did you think about that? Oh, man. It was nuts. Like, I had never been to Montana before, so yeah. flying into there was really cool to see all those, you know, mountains and stuff. Oh, sure. I'm a big mountain guy, so, uh, yeah, I love Colorado, so that was my first time going to Montana, and that was awesome just to, you know, see it out there. I'd love to go back. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, um, mm -hmm. and that kind of got you, so uh, I know they connect you with Spencer on that, uh, so it kind of get you, like, the whole, the whole process of kind of becoming official and what to do after the shot. And, and there's a lot of that, that a lot of people I think are going to be really interested in because it's probably something that people don't have the, uh, the opportunity to really even dive into, you know, you know, it's not very often, obviously that very many people are getting a buck of that caliper. So kind of how can you kind of run mm -hmm. us through the process of how that all started and kind of how Spencer helped you with like becoming officially scored and, and, you know, transitioning into potentially, you know, uh, earned income from this deer and stuff like that. Yeah, so, uh, like, me, I had no idea. Like, like, whenever Luke called me and all my buddies are telling me this stuff, like, I didn't even know there was, like, such things as deer shows or, like, sure. these, you know, go show your deer off or this and that. And so it was a brand new, like, thing. I mean, I'm just, you know, like I said earlier, I'm just a guy. I just love deer hunting. I love shooting deer, and I love sitting out in the woods. So yeah. all the business that I had, I had no idea about. Um, so he hooked me up with Spencer. Uh, Spencer called me that next day and just, I, you know, told him, you know, everything that's going on. And, uh, yeah, he helped me. He was just like, Hey man, there's going to be people wanting to buy this thing. Uh, there's going to be people wanting you to do endorsement shows, this and that. 
And so I knew this. Every time there would be a call or an email or something, I would just send it to Spencer. I'd call him and say, hey, this person's saying this, or hey, this person's asking this. Like, what what would this go for? Or what does this show go for? What does yeah. this go for? And he he knew like he he knew like what numbers were of what you know past people got and you know stuff like that. So I just kind of he kind of coached me through on you know what a good deal was, what a bad deal was, and um, so I've just kind of gone from listening to him and taking that you know with in this business side of oh, it, sure, I guess. Sure, sure. And then so we can kind of get into this too. So the the deer, I know obviously you you sold the antlers. I know you said that uh, prior, before we started getting recorded, you, you were able to keep the hide. And it was part of the stipulation that you had in your deal there. Um, so you're making the, the obviously it's, it's a replica that we're taking out now. So like the buck that we saw here at the expo or whatever, I'm assuming that was a replica at that time in March. And then kind of how, how did that, I mean, I, Spencer helped you through that process, but like, how is it? Can you give us a little bit more detail? I mean, we don't have to talk numbers or anything like that. I know you guys weren't keeping that that pretty lock and key, but obviously it's life changing. And so, you know, how does how did that all process go through in terms of like making the replicas and getting the taxidermy and and, and all that good stuff? Yeah. So, um, whenever I started getting offers, uh, there was only about two that uh, okay. were serious offers. Okay. And uh, so I went. I went probably over two months it was two or so months before i finally made the decision you know i just seeing what you know what numbers were out there and i finally got a number that i needed um and so yeah uh went over we made the deal uh i get replicas i got to keep the hide okay. of the original moose and i got Perfect. him on replica and i'm i think i'm gonna do a full body uh probably in a year or so okay put it in the basement and keep it there I, i'd like to have one of how he was whenever i shot him you know? oh yeah yeah for um, sure yeah with that shoulder back and yeah i'd love to have that in the basement sometime uh but yeah so got that uh i had the replica pretty fast um uh, after selling the horns and uh got the cape i took it to my taxidermy about 30 minutes away from my house and uh, I just took it down there, and he had a turn. I said, if I can have this, and it was, shoot, a month away maybe. I don't, I don't really know how long yeah. it was, but it was fast. Yeah. And I said, if I, if I can have this done by the Indianapolis show, uh, it was in February, late February. Yeah. And he said he said he would try, and sure enough, he got it done. So I got to take the, the pedestal, the yeah. mount, up to the Indianapolis show to show it off for the first time, like, with its original hide and everything uh but yeah it was a pretty quick process just because um he got it, it the turnaround time was quick uh, his name's charlie watts yeah uh, with two mile taxidermy north Vernon, indiana uh shout did out a charlie. hell of a job shout awesome. out charlie yeah because i i saw that pedestal mount man and i i mean, like i had no idea like you know before even listening to the media episode i had no idea that, that was even an industry i mean i know people sold their mounts to like bass pro shop and, and you know cabela's and you know what have you so but uh yeah that, we saw that mount there at the expo and i had no idea i mean it looks fantastic i mean that, he did a great job on that and i'm sure any tax service man that's probably like what dreams are made of for them you know that's <laughs> just like the bar was set for you the bar is probably set high for him too like he's <laughs> never going to be able to achieve that one again <laughs> yeah that's what's crazy and he actually did uh the Tim Beck buck was in there the same time his replica. So the Tim Beck buck was the uh, Indiana non-typical okay. shotgun record. Okay. And so he it was in there whenever Moose was getting taxed. So I got to see that buck, and it's a it's a monster non-typical. Yeah. So that was pretty cool just to see. And he had he had elk on the wall and stuff. Just just a cool place. Oh, for sure. And that's what I was kind of telling you too. And we mentioned it, but like him you know moose being typical like even at the show or whatever it's just like i uh it, it's very deceiving like how big he is because when you're thinking 200 inch plus deer you're thinking these like monstrosities they got stuff kicking every way and and uh you know he's yep. just like perfectly i mean just like textbook whitetail and it's just like you you don't think he's as big as he is and man you get up on him and you're like holy smokes like i just I, you see why you call him moose you know what i mean because i mean he, he looks like yeah. a damn moose like it's just there's nothing else to say yeah i mean he just he's thick all the way through yeah. man. that's what's so crazy like even the 
you know, his tines, his G2s, G3s, like the measurements that don't get, like the circumference of those that don't get measured in the system, in the Boone and Crockett system, I mean, he's got four and a half inch circumference on yeah. his tines going up yeah. G2s and G2s. That's what's so crazy, like how he just carries his mass. All the way through. You know, through his, all the way through. Yeah. Must have been that lucky buck mineral. <laughs> yeah. Had to be, had to be <laughs> up there. I, and that's what my neighbor told me. He said, he said I spent a lot of money on that deer because he had him on trail cam, uh, him eating his meal for three years yep. in a row. <laughs> yep, I saw. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, well, I'm gonna. He said, I'm gonna keep putting it out. He goes, but all I ask is if you shoot another big one, just let me come, come see it. I said, all right, I will. <laughs> <laughs> deal, deal. And that was funny because I saw you had posted that thing about the the lucky buck and that trail camera picture of him eating it. And uh, we actually got a yep. promotion. We got a promotion going on right now. If you're buying a trail camera, then we're giving away a, a free bucket of Lucky Buck. Uh, we're you know we're a dealer here as well. And oh, cool. I'm like, man, we just need that picture of moose on there. We'll sell all sorts of them out here, especially in Central Ohio. We got we got <laughs> giants all over the place. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> so I had one quick question. Um, so in kind of backtracking in the process with Spencer and everything. Um, I know there are going to be haters and people that might say, well, oh, he, you know, he poached his high fence, whatever. Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, how did they, what was the process like to verify that, that you actually, um, you know, killed it on the property and, you know, documented all that stuff to make sure that people couldn't say, oh, it's a high fence deer, you know, whatever, but he poached it, you know, maybe go into that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question, Then Thanks. Yeah, so the next day after I shot him, like Spencer advised me to call DNR. And so I called DNR, uh, the next day and uh, the dispatcher lady picked up and I was like, Hey ma'am, I was like, I think I killed the biggest deer in Indiana. I just need to know what to do. Like I need people to come look at this thing or what do I need to do? And she was just like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. I'm like, I was like, you know, and I'm just like, I don't know. I was like, I was advised to call you. I killed this big deer. So anyways, nobody shows up. Like, she thought I was crazy. I was like, whatever. <laughs> so I just got this deer. In the, I got it in the walk-in cooler. You know, it's just gutted out. We're just waiting, you know, because I don't really know what the process is. Oh, sure. What I'm going to do with it. I'm, sure. I'm waiting for people to call, Bass Pro to call. You know, I didn't know what was going on. And so... Uh, Finally, about four or five days later, DNR calls me, and uh, which I was in Nashville. I was writing songs and recording a couple songs that week, and uh, he was like, "Hey, man, I'm here at your house." I'm like, "Well, I'm I'm down south, you know. I'm, I got work to do." I said, "But I'll be back up in a couple of days." Yeah. Well, he's like, "Well, we're gonna go to the property," and so we were literally just texting each other, me and this CO officer, uh, and we were just texting like aerial maps and he goes where where at and i would drop a pin you know like where i was and finally he calls me back he said hey i found your gut pile or i found what's left of the gut pile i said sure. perfect yeah that's i got him down to the collar and i said if you go right up that little draw you know probably 60 yards or so i said you'll find a tree i said i cut off a couple limbs on my way up yeah and he found he ended up finding my tree and he goes yep looks about 20 foot up where you cut off your first limb i said yep i got up about you know 22 25 foot and i cut off those last two uh so they confirmed that but they were still dude people calling oh, from yeah. all over the place mm -hmm. i mean shoot it was it was weeks later after they confirmed they they had to come back over so i set them down in in the living room and i said hey boys like i'll tell you from the day I, the day I, you know, got into town and the day I killed the deer and I just explained the whole situation and, and I'm, I'm sure they're still getting calls is what they oh, said. Yeah. I mean, but we, we ended up getting, I went and got, this is, I still had the original rack and brought it up and we were just taking pictures with it. And so they were, they were really cool CO guys and I still got their number. So if anything happened, you know, yeah. I told them, just give me a call. I'd love to clear anything up that you guys need oh for sure yeah yeah i mean and i thought i've heard you say this before too but that like that area i mean you got some heavy heavy pressure and some heavy uh, did you even say some poaching up in that area as well yeah. so i mean yeah, it, literally. 
Good. Yeah, after shooting moose, like the property owner has, has found four four deer with their heads cut off. It's wild. It's wild. It's like, and so, yeah. you know, they, they were giving you crap about it on media about like having the area and stuff and, you know, and making sure that like, you're not giving it away. <laughs> but you could kind of see why too, because, you yeah. know, everybody and their brother is going to want to try to see. Hopefully he bred, you know, he's got some offspring out there running around <laughs> that are high class, high quality deer as well. And so, you gotta try to keep yep. that a little bit secret that's that's where that uh not buck buck blow hard but that's kind of where that like you know you gotta kind of protect yourself a little yeah. bit too you know what i mean like i know you, you you're just hunting mm -hmm. but at the same time like that that whole area i'm sure those other guys appreciate it too because they sound like the the guys that had them on camera eight miles away i mean they sound like they were really good active mm -hmm. hunters and and really heavily involved with it. So you're yep. trying to just keep the area good for everyone. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to have to have this like influx of people trying to come and shoot mm -hmm. the next world-class deer. Yep. So going on from here, you know, it's all downhill from here now, right brother? There ain't not. So, uh, yep. what, uh, everything's, everything's easy. Do you just kind of throw that one to the side? Like, obviously that was something special and you're just going to go ahead and try to try to re up your one thirty four game or how, how's this process going to work? What's your, what's your mindset going into the 2022 season this year? Well, I got, I got two different. I always, I always joke about whenever people ask, like, what are you going to shoot next? And I yeah. said, I'm going to shoot the first one that walks by. There you go. <laughs> That's what, uh, Reset I yourself. About this first, first little bat. First little basket that comes by is getting shot. But now, 134, dude, I'm, I'm going to try to just go from that, man. Just if I can shoot a 140, a 150, you know, any, I'm just going to try to work my way up from my 2020 buck. I mean, moose is just something that I'm never even going to try to, you know, top because, I mean, it's just yeah. <laughs> yeah. most likely not going to happen. So I'm just, I'm just going back to, you know, just shooting deer. It's what I, what I've always done. There you go. There you go. And then one thing, I guess I'm double back a little bit too. So like the, you, you mentioned you had a couple people interested in buying his horns. Um, is that, was that kind of more like on the private collector side or is that kind of more on like the bigger, the bigger box or bigger box store kind of side to like, I mean, how does that, how does that kind of work? It's just, um, yeah, no, no big, like stores reached out to me. I actually reached out to um, Bass Pro Cabela's just because, like, even Spencer was like, he's like, I don't even know if those guys still buy, sure. you know, horn, you know, antlers anymore. Um, and I have learned now, you know, so the only two big offers I had was from the collectors, okay. private collectors. Talking to those guys, you know, they those the collectors now are kind of the middleman for. Bass Pro, oh, okay. Cabela's, yeah. and you, know, you know what I mean? So yeah. like mm -hmm. In the early 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, Bass Pro was buying up all these heads, and they got, I mean, shoot, they, well, the one collector I talked to, he said, they got, you know, 2,000 heads just in inventory, oh, just sitting in a basement somewhere that, you know, then they'll, they'll send them to auction or something down the road. So they're just, they got so many heads, so these private collectors are building their I guess collections, and then I assume later on in life, like Bass Pro will be, you know, wanting want something later down the road. But I'm not really sure about that process. But yeah, Bass Pro never returned any of my emails or phone calls, so I don't think they were. <laughs> they must have a have a middleman that they oh, they deal sure. with. Vance Outdoors would have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to get a we need so we got this studio space here now we recently started filming our podcast so i think you're going to be probably the fourth or fifth one um that we're airing on this but i wouldn't mind moose hanging out right here he might take up too much of the room though <laughs> he might be right up in my grill <laughs> put, put him right there yeah put him right here on the wall but um well I want to kind of give you a chance to, so before we get into where people can find you and all that good stuff, man, uh, I'm going to ask you a question here as, as a singer and songwriter, what are we going to pick? We're going to pick the, uh, the grand old Opry or are we going to pick the opportunity to shoot moose again? Which or a one? bigger one or a bigger one. Which one are you going with? Shooting, shooting, uh, shooting something <laughs> bigger, man. Yeah. There I you mean, go, brother. That's what I like. That's, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I love, I love country music. I love, you know, 
but dude, I get I get more thrill about. I mean, I I would love to step in that circle someday on the Grand Ole Opry, but oh yeah, dude, just just me sitting on me writing a song in a tree stand is and shooting a deer after writing a song, you know, sitting there for three or four hours. I mean, that's that's just life. I mean, I just oh, yeah. I just love that stuff. You know, it's just it's on my time. I just it's just something that I I just enjoy. So yeah, just. I would definitely take, you know, sitting in a tree stand and standing up on it and shooting a, a world-class buck than singing one song on the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah. The real question is, how, which one's going to make you shake the most? What was that? I, I didn't, no, you're good. I said cut out there. No, that you're good. I said the the. Uh, I guess the real question is, which one's going to make you shake the most with adrenaline? Oh yeah, and I guarantee it's going to be the uh, shooting the deer because I don't think I would black out on the uh, Grand Ole Opry. I'd probably be real nervous, but I, I mean, I'm telling you, the adrenaline that I had a moose like, I, for three days. I mean, three days later, I had to oh, put yeah. my phone down because I was, you know, taking calls just because I couldn't, and I just had to pace back and forth just because I was still shook up three days later. That's awesome. Well, not knowing he's around. And then he walks in, just oh, made it, I'm sure, a hundred times crazier when you saw him. Oh, yeah. It's not like you knew that deer was there at all. Yeah. It's just like, you know, you're sitting there, next thing you know, a freaking Moby Dick comes out, and you're like, mm-hmm. holy smokes. Yeah. Yeah, these, these antlers just appeared through the creek bottom. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, brother, uh, where can people find you? I know you're, uh, and kind of how can they, if someone wanted to look at maybe having you do an appearance or something like that, where, where can people find all that information out? Go ahead and pitch all your social media and, and how people can find you, man. Yes. Um, so I'm on Instagram, Facebook, uh, at the Huff Buck. Um, you can shoot me messages there or uh, my email should be on there too. Uh, but yeah, I'll be doing shows all this year into next year. We're going to be showing the deer off at places. And then I'm also going to be playing, you know, 45 minutes to an hour with my guitar um, and just kind of bringing the music and the deer together and just going around and showing it all. Heck yeah, man. So, well, uh, well, hopefully we got, I know you can't make it to our event in August. I know you're going to be up at an expo, but uh, hopefully maybe sometime we can get you up here and in Buckeye Lake and have you play again. I know I just missed you last week in Granville, but uh, at least you know how to get here now. So yeah, we'll just have you swing on up sometime. Yeah. I'd love to, man. That'd be awesome. Well, I know we had some technical issues, and I appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us, man. And uh, we look forward to, to talking to you in the future. And, and best of luck with your career in the music industry and, and uh, you know, safe travels as you go to all these expos, buddy. Thank you, Jordan. Man, I appreciate y'all for having me. All right, Thank you, sir. Have a good afternoon, man. All right, everyone. That's all we have for you today. We hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dustin. What an absolutely life-changing experience, and we're so thankful that he took the time to share it with us today. As always, we appreciate you listening. Please give us a rating and share this episode with a friend. And until next time, enjoy the pursuit. <laughs>